going to write methods or functions that return a value to the calling statement. And the only difference between this and a void method is we do have a return type. And that return type could be a string, it could be an int, a float, a bool, a double, any particular data type. It could even be a specialized data type like a color, which I'm going to show you in, my, in the example here. And the other difference is it must have a return statement for every terminal fork of that code block. So if you use something like a switch statement or an if else if statement that ends the code, each one of those blocks or forks must have a return statement. And that value that's being returned must match the same data type that we specified up here for the return type. More often than not, when we call this, we're going to we're going to return that value to the method call. So, and we might pass some arguments that would be in the parameter list, and then we're going to assign whatever value is returned to the container. And usually, that container is a variable. It could be a property, which again I'm going to show you in this example. Um, it could be a list. It could be an array. Um, there's lots of there's lots of different containers that we can use. Let's look at an example where we're calling a method that returns a value. So I have a button named BTN color, and on the click event, we're going to take the, another button called BTN populate and modify its back color property to a method call of random color. We're not passing any arguments here, and random color receives no parameters. Random color returns a color. Remember, back color is a color data type. And we do the same thing for for color. Now, what random color is going to do, it's going to randomly generate a color from the different ranges for red, green, blue, and create a color from those random values and return that back. So again, our return type is color, and color.fromargb, which is our red, green, blue values that we're generating, is a color data type. Let's see this run in Visual Studio. I'm back in our previous project we used for the void methods and I added a button called color button and it is named btn color. I'm just going to double click on it. I already added the code we just talked about and so here is my event procedure for btn color underscore click and I'm calling populate dot back color equals random color, so random color method, not passing it any values. Same thing for the for color, and here's our method. So it returns a data type of color. We're going to use the random object, which I named rnd, and for the r value, an integer value, I'm going to take rnd.next256. Now it's interesting, we're talking about, about methods, so this is a method that returns a value. Next is a method, I can tell that by the parentheses. I'm passing it an argument of 256. That's the upper range of the integers that I want to randomly generate from, from 0 to 256. And that will give me a range from 0 to 255. So it's going to return some number between 0 and 255, and that's going to be assigned then to R. And I do the same thing for green, and the same thing for blue, or, or the GB variables. And then our color class has a method called from ARGB and we pass it the red, green, blue integers. And those must have a value between 0 and 255. And it's going to generate a color from that that is one of those 16.7 million different colors that are available to us in a 24-bit color system. And it's going to return that color back to our calling statement of back color, randomly changing that color, and then we'll call it again in a run that procedure again, randomly generating those three different variables, creating a new color, passing that back, and assigning it to the four color. Let's watch it run. So I click the color button, and I get a new back color and four color. What's interesting, I was testing this earlier, and I noticed that I get the same color, back color and four color, every time I click the color button. And my code is all correct. It should be presenting two different colors, one for back color, one for four color. And here's the issue. Somewhere, because of the speed of my computer, or the speed that our computers are today, um, the random color is getting assigned to both. And I think that's a bug somewhere along the way. 
I'm going to report this to Microsoft and see if they can provide any insight on this. But here's a workaround. So as I said, the issue is simply that it's processing too fast. So what I'm going to do in my random color method is I'm going to add a sleep command, which is part of the thread framework. And so I added a using system threading directive. So then in my random color, I'm going to add a thread dot sleep command. And in parentheses, I can specify how many milliseconds I want to pause the execution of my program. And I don't want to pause it too much. I'm just going to try 100. So basically one tenth of a second and see if that will force to have a different color come across. So I'm going to start my program again, click the color button, and now I'm getting two different colors for the back color and the four color. Now sometimes those colors are not complementary since we are randomly generating them, and sometimes it's very hard to see maybe the text, but we can see now that we're getting two different colors. And of course, the, this is not necessarily a exercise in practicality, it's simply a demonstration of how we can call a method multiple times. But that now seems to be working pretty well. And at one tenth of a second, there really is not much of a delay. Let's take a look at one more example. So I've created a program to convert between different measurements that we might use in cooking. So I'm going to put in 20, and say we have 20 ounces of a, of a liquid, and I want to know how many cups that would be. So I can click over here what I want the equivalent measure to be, and click Convert, and I'm told that's 2.5 cups. I could also check to see if it's teaspoons. There's 120 teaspoons. Tablespoons. How many pints would that be? How many quarts? And how many gallons? Now, there might seem to be a lot of code to this, fairly complicated program, but I'm going to show you again how we can use uh, methods that return a value to make this a little bit simpler. Let's jump over to Visual Studio. Let me start by walking you through the interface I've created. So I have two uh, group boxes here, one labeled group box one, the other one's just simply group box two. I don't refer to those in code, I left that the same. And then the text of this one is convert, and the text of the one on the right is two equivalent. So on the left, the user is going to enter a measurement and then choose what the classification is of that measurement. This text box is txt start value. And then I have a bunch of radio buttons that are mutually exclusive because they're all in this one group panel. So we have RB ounces, RB TSP, RB TBSP, RB cup, RB pint, RB quart and RB gallon. I have a convert button named BTN convert. Over here in this right panel, this is a text box named TXT equivalent value. And I did set the read only property to true, so that's kind of grayed out. So the user can't change the value in this text box. I could use the label here as well. And it's named TXT equivalent value. Then these radio buttons are basically same as these, but they're RB ounces equivalent, RB TSP equivalent, RB TS TBSP equivalent, RB cup equivalent, RB pint equivalent, RB quart equivalent, and RB gallon equivalent. So the way I'm going to code this convert button is I want to figure out the measurement over here. How many ounces is that? So we know that a cup is eight ounces. So if I put in two cups, then that would be 16 ounces. Then over here on the equivalent, I'll simply figure out what the equivalent measurement would be of that many ounces in this particular measurement. So let's take a look at the code. And I have my btn convert underscore click event procedure. I'm going to have a variable called start, which I'm going to take that txt start value dot text and convert it to a double value. My ounces is going to equal get ounces. I'm going to pass it the start. So this here is a method that returns a value. By the way, this is also a method that returns a value. And we can tell that by it's got parentheses. That's a method. 
The fact that it returns a value allows us to assign that value to this variable. That, of course, is built into uh, C sharp. So we're going to write this get ounces and we're going to pass it the value of start and then place the result into my ounces. So here's our get ounces method. And it's going to receive a double value because we're passing it a double value and we just named that double value XYZ. So I'm going to set ounces equal to 0.0, .0 and then I used a bunch of ternary statements. We could have done a, a series of sequential ifs, a little more readable using these ternaries. So ounces equals, and if RB ounces is dot checked, remember we only have one of these checks, only one of these seven will run. Uh, I'm going to set it equal to XYZ. So we're going from ounces to ounces, it's going to be the same. Otherwise, we'll set the value to ounces. If RB TSP is checked, we'll set XYZ times 1.0 divided by 6.0 or 1 sixth and since there's six teaspoons in an ounce otherwise we'll set it to ounces and I just kind of go through those seven different measurements check and see if they check tablespoon if so we do the appropriate conversion to ounces or RB cup or pint or quart or gallon and since the false value in each of these is ounces, only one of these is going to change the value uh, that's assigned to ounces because only one of these can be true. But the others that are false will simply retain whatever value of ounces is there. And then I return ounces. So that gives us the number of ounces that we started with, regardless of whatever that measurement type was. Then I have another variable called double equivalent. And I, of course, I could have combined this into one line, but I'm going to go ahead and do that. So double equivalent equals get equivalent my ounces. So here's another method. We're going to pass it my ounces. We just determined how many ounces we're starting with. And it's going to basically be the same thing. I'm going to pass it my ounces into a double variable called OZ. And then I'm going to set an equivalent value variable to 0.0. .0 and then set that equivalent value, again using ternaries, to whichever radio button on the right is checked to take the ounces and do some mathematics to determine what that is equivalent to in terms of the measurement type that's been selected. One of these should change the value of, e of equiv value. The others just simply maintain the value of equiv value because it would be false. And then we return equiv value. So whatever that equivalent value is goes into equivalent and then my txt equivalent.txt equals equivalent.toString and I'm going to code it for two decimal places. So very straightforward. Again, these ternaries make this very nice and readable. And once again, let me just run my program so you can see it here. So if we say there are 12 pints and I convert that to cups, and of course there's two cups in a pint, we get 24. We convert that to gallons, we get one and a half. Convert it to ounces, that's a lot of ounces. Teaspoons are going to be more. So the code, if we have a problem, it's easy to debug. We have a very short number of lines here that are doing the work, but they're calling these other methods. And so if I'm not getting the correct conversion, I know my error exists either in the ounces or in the equivalent, and I can actually do a message box here to see how many ounces that are that's being returned to find out if my error is here or if it's here.